Welcome to part two of my quest to take on the hour record and see if I can beat Eddie Merckx, the greatest cyclist of all time. Quick recap, the hour record is beautifully simple. It's how far you can ride around a velodrome in one hour. It was first done in 1873 on a penny farthing and since then it's been regarded as the ultimate test for a cyclist. And in 1972, Eddie Merckx, the greatest of all time, set a record distance of 49.431 kilometers. And this has long been regarded as a benchmark. Merckx's record was performed on standard equipment and it stood until the 1980s when it was beaten through the use of better technology. And that then started a period where it was continually beaten by the best riders of the day, employing advances in aerodynamic technology. Now Merckx is an exceptionally gifted athlete. Physiologically, I'm nowhere near him. I could never hope to produce anywhere near as much power as the Belgian cannibal who ate steaks and bike races for breakfast. I'm training as hard as I can. I'm gonna be the fittest I've ever been. I've never trained this hard with as much structure and discipline as I am doing with the help of expert coaches, Neil Henderson and Matt Cassin from the Sufferfest. They've subject me to some really intense fitness tests and their brutal assessment, the grim reality, is that even with the best training in the world, the fitness gains that I'm going to see aren't going to get me anywhere near Eddie on their own. However, if you think that getting fitter through the Sufferfest is the only weapon in my armoury, then you clearly haven't been paying attention because I didn't spend 10 years at university for nothing. Oh no, I'm going to use science. See, the thing is, when traveling at 50 kilometers an hour, 90% of the resistance that I'm going to encounter is through aerodynamic drag. Now, in theory, using science and technology, if I can get sufficiently more aerodynamic, I should be able to ride faster than Eddie for much less power. Since the Merckx era, bikes and clothing have become far more aerodynamic. And we've also seen technology from other sports, such as Formula One, come into cycling and have a huge impact. Which is why I've come here to the Boardman Performance Wind Tunnel Centre near Evesham. I'm going to be meeting with Dr. Xavier Disley of AeroCoach. He's an aerodynamicist and engineer who helps top level and elite cyclists become as aerodynamic and as fast as possible. He's also going to be helping me become as aerodynamic and as fast as possible. Probably his toughest challenge yet. This is the bike Merckx used. His clothing was basic by modern standards too. Modern bikes allow riders to get into far more aerodynamic positions and the latest frame tube shapes and cutting edge fabrics that can be worn also reduce drag significantly. If I used the kind of setup Merckx had, I would not have a prayer of getting anywhere near 49.431 kilometers. The amount of power a cyclist can produce can be expressed in watts. Having tested this kind of setup in the wind tunnel, we can calculate that if I were to use Merckx's equipment, I would have to produce 440 watts for an hour. Considering I can currently do around 280 watts, this would be impossible for me. Nerd alert now. 
but, but pay attention because I promise it'll be worth it. So when we measure how aerodynamic an object is, for example, in the wind tunnel, we calculate its drag coefficient. This is called the CDA. It doesn't have any units, it's just a number. And the lower the number, the more aerodynamic a given object is. So for example, a sphere is said to have a CDA of 0.47, whereas an aerofoil is said to have a CDA of 0.04, a much smaller number, it's a much more aerodynamic object. The reason why I would have to produce so much more power with a Merck style setup is because my CDA would be 0.29, which coincidentally is the same as a Nissan 350Z. The world's best male time trialists like Tom de Moulin typically have a CDA of around 0.18 to 0.2, which coincidentally is the same as a General Motors EV1 electric car. Interestingly, the world's best women, athletes like Chloe Diger, often have a lower CDA than the world's best men, because women are typically smaller. Anyway, if I can get my drag coefficient, my CDA, into the realms of these pro athletes, then the amount of power that I need to produce to equal or better Eddie Merckx becomes much more feasible potentially into the realms of around 300 watts, which is potentially something I could do. We're now gonna look at the difference that modern clothing can make, and no pins have kindly agreed to support us with aerodynamic clothing so we can demonstrate this. Starting with an aerodynamic jersey and shorts, the kind of equipment that you'd wear in a race or a road ride. I'm also gonna be testing on my time trial bike. The reason for this is that we're mainly looking at the difference position makes, and this bike has loads of adjustability in it which will allow us to test different things. For the actual attempt, I will be using a dedicated track bike as they are faster and slightly more aerodynamic. But for now, this is ideal. So what we're doing now with Ollie is getting some baseline data. So his starting position, which we're gonna do with bibs and jersey and a normal road helmet. And we're testing him at 50 kilometers an hour because that's pretty much the speed he needs to go to break the record that Merckx did. We're now gonna put on a time trial helmet and see how that drops my drag coefficient. We're also gonna do a bike only run. And what that allows us to do is to see out of the total drag, what percentage of the drag is Ollie and what percentage is the bike. We know that the rider accounts for the vast majority of the aero drag, but it'll be nice to see how much of it exactly is for Ollie. Now that Zav has established that 29% of the drag is my bike and roughly 71% is me, what we cover me in becomes hugely significant. So this is the brand new No Pins Flow Suit. It's just been approved for the Tokyo Olympics and features a brand new high-tech fabric called Speed Scale, which is supposed to be excellent at reducing drag in lots of different scenarios. I'm also wearing some special flow covers. These are integrated shoe covers and aero socks, and they actually make a measurable difference. The uh, turbulent airflow around your moving legs means that, well, if you can cover it in something that reduces drag, it's really useful. But let's see how much lower this makes my drag coefficient. That's been a really productive session in the wind tunnel. We've managed to get my drag coefficient down to 0.18, which is really competitive. It means I'm pretty aerodynamic. And I'm also really confident because once I get on a track bike with a double disc wheel setup, I'll be even more aerodynamic in theory. But being able to be aero in the wind tunnel is one thing. Doing it for real and putting the power out on the track 
is a completely different thing. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to go to the track and I'm going to try riding at our record pace in the positions and see what happens. Just about to ride this BMC for the first time on the boards and do a bit of a warm up maiden voyage. a lot to do well I feel like I've got a lot to do because this is all new riding round the track and holding the black line and there's an art to it and a deceptive amount of technique I think the best people in the world when they do it and you watch them on the Olympics they make it look easy but <laughs> you forget that they're professionals <laughs> and uh, yeah but I feel confident like I think just riding there around going around 46 kilometers an hour felt quite comfortable so yeah feel good but nervous so in order to measure ollie's aerodynamic drag around the velodrome we have the track aero system which is a system of software and hardware which takes all the data off his bike and then transmits it to the computer and we can see his cda or aerodynamic drag live in real terms every single second as he rides around so what I'm gonna do now is put a small sensor on his bike, um, which will connect to our kit, and then we'll get him out on track and see what his CDA is on this new bike. Take two laps to wind down, that's fine. So I've done our aero testing session today at Newport. You'll have to excuse a bit of the noise now because there's a, a derny whizzing round, but... Uh, I hope there's some good news, Zav. There is, so there is good news, Ollie. Okay, good. Um, what's, what's great about what we found out today is that even though you haven't ridden on a, set, on a set of aero bars around the track before, although you do have a lot of experience with time trials, we've managed to match the CDA, the aerodynamic drag that we saw in the tunnel on your time trial bike, round here in a more kind of live scenario. Um, on a very kind of you know alien bike to you that you hadn't yeah. ridden before. So we did do some runs where you were riding at record pace, uh, where we were focusing more on seeing how well you can hold a position rather than just what the CDA says on the screen. So what's it saying? So the, the starting CDA was um, kind of similar to the starting CDA you saw on the TT bike in the tunnel. Um, you'd set the bikes up relatively similarly. I thought my hands were like that. But your hands were a bit lower, exactly. Yeah. Are there any other gains that I can make? Can I get even faster? The good news is, is that You've only just set the bike up and we've made a few tweaks to it, but there are some more mechanical things that we can play with. Um, front disc is a good one, so that will help speed you up a little bit. We've already done some work on tyre pressure, which was another improvement still. Um, and then also the drivetrain. So if we get you a carbon drivetrain and get the chain line exactly perfect, that'll help. Um, and then the last thing is the front end. We're going to build you some custom carbon aero extensions just to squeeze out every last little watt. Right, well... Thanks for today, man. That's all right. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, I've got a long way to go, but yeah. Just get some hard training in, you'll be fine. <laughs> it's been really cool riding around the track and in the velodrome and getting that aerodynamic data. And the exciting and really interesting thing now is that I can send that data over to Neil and Mac from the Sufferfest, and then they can tell me what I'm going to need to do physiologically in order to achieve my goal and how much power I'll need to produce. Hopefully, it's not 400 watts because I can't do 400 watts. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, good to see you, Neil. Definitely, Oliver. Very good to see you. Uh, sorry, I'm here alone today. Mac is uh, actually might might still be in a plane. He not, he's on his way to Australia for the uh, Track Cycling World Cup in Brisbane this weekend. Oh, he's got a good excuse then. I'll, I'll forgive him. Yeah, <laughs> reasonable excuse. So looking at my CDA data that we've managed to get from from the from the track and, and the tunnel, how does that translate physiologically now in terms of what I'm going to have to do to, to achieve this? 
Yep. Ultimately, there's uh, basically a, a cost associated with any given CDA as well as air density conditions. So if we think of air density, that's temperature, pressure, and saturation. So using the values at Newport, if we get the temperature there to about 25 degrees Celsius, uh, assuming that the humidity is around 50% or so uh, with a barometric pressure of about 10, 10 millibars, that puts the air density about 1.17. For your weight, you know, there's a rolling resistance component as well. So you plus bike is going to probably be somewhere around 76, 77 kilograms total and giving you a nice fast tire rolling resistance, rolling resistance of uh, probably closer to 0 0.0025. It's going to require to go 49.43 kilometers per hour speed, approximately 304 watts. Okay. That's the current cost with that CDA. So what sort of training and stuff can we do going forwards to, well, try and get my, my power up to hopefully even more than that? Um, yeah, yeah over, the, over the next year. Yeah, there's kind of two components that we're going to look at. Number one is actually continuing um, to kind of push on some of that upper ceiling, some of our power work in that dynamic position because there, you know, that ceiling does set a little bit what is possible, what is sustainable underneath that. So we're going to keep pushing up that ceiling. The other thing that that's going to help you do is be able to tolerate that standing start effort because clearly there's a pretty significant demand of getting accelerated up to nearly 50K an hour in just, you know, 15, 20 seconds. Secondary to that, we're going to be working on that, that threshold and that FTP, but instead of doing long efforts at and above, we're going to predominantly stay just below to push up that threshold rather than go above it and try to pull it up. Um, if we think about some of the adaptations, we're trying to be able to have a, a high flux of lactate at that uh, threshold point. That's kind of part of it. It's about being able to take up and utilize what is being produced. So there's some component of our general endurance to produce less lactate, but when we start to work harder, we are producing a lot of it. And so it's actually enhancing that flux rate. All right. Sound fun? Yeah, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Yeah, I'm going to give everything. Cool. Right. Well, I'm going to have to go crack on. But great talking to you, Evan Neal, and I'll uh, catch up with you next week. All right. Good luck, Oliver. I've learned a lot the last few days. It's been really interesting and I'm under no illusions as to how hard this is going to be. I feel like I'm climbing a mountain, Mount Suffolandria. There's a lot of work to do, but getting more aerodynamic has given me some, uh, some confidence that what we're doing, there is a chance I can pull this off. So I'm going to keep training. And I mean, this is the most structured, most disciplined training I've ever done in my life, but I'm going to give it my all. And if you've enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to stay updated on my progress, there's going to be continual weekly updates in the GCN show. There's also going to be some longer form videos like this one. So stay tuned for those. Click the bell, subscribe, you know the drill. And there's also going to be updates on my social media, so on Instagram and Strava too. And the attempt is scheduled at the moment for the 17th of February in Newport. But in the meantime, let me know how you're getting on with your own Sufferfest hours of power down in the comments section below. And I'll see you next time.